Hello and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good morning. Hey, if you are new, you are visiting with us today. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor here and could not be more excited that you are here with us. If you're joining us online, if you're here in person, we really are glad you are worshiping with us today. And I want to thank everybody who was here last week, especially those who were serving last week on Easter. It was just a great day. I hope, I hope that um, God did something really awesome in you and your family. So we just kind of celebrated the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, what it means for our lives. And we couldn't have done what we were able to do last week without people just uh, being willing to serve. Some of you guys were here all three services. Really appreciate you and just your willingness to kind of not only come to worship, but to also just to kind of give on that day and, and so that you, so that other people uh, can experience the service as well. And as I was reflecting on that, you know, two days later, I slept for two days, you know, after the three services, but two days later, as I was reflecting on it, I was thinking like this, this idea popped into my head that every Sunday is somebody's Easter. And what I mean by that is every Sunday here, there is someone here who's here for the first time. Or there's someone here who hasn't been in a while and it took some effort, some energy, something to overcome for them to come back to church. And every Sunday, someone like that needs someone like you to serve them, to love them. There are people here that if, they, if you were, had been here on that Sunday, hey, you knew them, you could have, you could have welcomed them better. Or because of a, a connection that you guys have, you would have been just the right person for them. And so what we want to build into kind of our culture here is a real attitude is like, hey, we want your presence here simply not just, you know, it, it just at a minimum, just for your own spiritual health and your rhythms of worshiping God and connecting with him. But just want you to also just kind of grow to kind of see a little, see a little clearer, just eyes more wide open about every, every time you are here, you have an incredible opportunity to bring impact and life to someone else. And so you're going to hear us talk about this a little bit more over the next few weeks, about it's just as a church, just individually having a ministry mindset of like, hey, you know, maybe I'm kind of tired this week, but I know I'm, on, I'm going to be there because my service, my presence is needed, and, 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 and they need me. There, there are people there who need me for them. And just really having this heart for those outside of ourselves. Again, we're going to talk about this some more, but as it was just kind of fresh in my mind, I kind of wanted to throw that out to you. And uh, for those of you who know me, you may not be surprised to know, to hear me say again, that I really, I really, I'm really a movie guy. I really love movies. I like to see a lot of movies. And Mondays for me are kind of my day. Monday is a day off for me, and there's just very little more kind of therapeutic, recharging for me than to go see a movie. And the kind of movies I like to see on Monday, big blockbusters, I'll go opening weekend. You know, there's some movies, Heidi wants to come with me, but my favorite Monday movie, we'll call it the formulaic movies. And what do I mean by that? It's one of those movies where when you go into it, you know exactly what's going to happen. You're not confused. You're not confused about the plot, right? It's not like, oh, there's going to be some huge plot twist. You, these, these action movies that are, ex, they're exactly, they're all essentially the same. The most recent one I saw last week was Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I, I just, I, just give the pause, give the pause, <laughs> yeah, or, or whatever it is you're going to say, right? Okay. Um, and I get, I see, I didn't get, to, I didn't get to participate in this when I was a kid growing up. You know, it was kind of, it was kind of, it was kind of, it was, it was considered evil, right? I don't know if it was because you're pretending to be somebody else or there's demon or whatever, right? And so I liked it. And it's a quest movie. I don't know if you've ever been to a quest movie. You know exactly how it's going to go. The team's got to come together. They're divided at first, but then they come together and they've got to do this. But oh no, they're not going to be able to do it. Oh, they did it. And now there's the next thing. Go, oh no, oh, they did it. And in the end, it all works out and everybody gets, it's, it's great. It's great. It's, it's safe. It's fun. You don't have to be stressed. Fast and the Furious 10 is coming out. And you know, mm, come on now. 
You know, exa- you know exactly what it's going to be like. They're going to defy the laws of physics. They're going to save the world by driving cars quickly. <laughs> Family. And, and it's, and it's going to be... And it's going to be good. It's just going to be good. And it's not stressful. It's not, no, no, you know, there's no, heart, there's never heartbreaking endings or like devastating plot twists. It's just, it's just safe, right? It's fun. And here's the thing. Here's why I bring this up. Sometimes I think when we read the Bible or we're, especially we're reading stories or some of the stories about Jesus, I think we start to think of them as formulaic. Like, well, okay, yeah, okay, I, I get this. And we're, we're starting right now, we're going to start a series on miracles. We'll be doing this for the next month and a half or so. Kind of going through Jesus' miracles. And I think there's a tendency when we're reading these or learning about these to kind of think, okay, I, I, I get this. There's kind of something that happens. You know, you know, Jesus is really nice to people and he's got a lot of power. And that's really kind of all that we think to it. But if you, if you put all of them together... If we study and we look at it the right way, over time, we're going to build an incredible puzzle, a mosaic, a picture of who Jesus is. And they're not, there's a lot more going on in these miracles than we think. Now, there is a formula to them, and I just kind of want to explain that to you real quick. There's something that we're going to see no matter what miracle we look at, right? There's kind of three parts to this. The first one is there's a need. A need is going to be expressed of some kind. Someone is hungry, someone has a demon, someone is tired, someone is dead, uh, there's a scary situation of some kind. We're going to see all of those over the next few weeks. There is some sort of need that someone has. And then they have some sort of encounter with Jesus. Now this is where I think we want to put most of our effort. Because there's going to be something that happens here when Jesus interacts with this particular person. And depending on the need that they have and depending on who that person is, we're going to see Jesus demonstrate a lot of different characteristics. Sometimes it's, he, he'll say, it is your faith that has healed you. Sometimes the person can't show faith and it's the friends that brought him. It was their faith. Sometimes there isn't any faith at all. There was no one that thought that Jesus was going to calm that storm. There was no, certainly no one that thought that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But there's something, there's always something about what Jesus is wanting to do. And I think the more that we understand and kind of see a lot of different pictures, we get a fuller picture of who Jesus is and a fuller picture of the way that Jesus is wanting to interact with us. And then it always ends with a resolution. And again, in all of these stories, there's none of these where Jesus is like, well, I tried, but I couldn't, right? I mean, he always is bringing, he always is bringing, um, uh, he, he always meets the need. But even still in some of these resolutions, we'll see some people choosing then to follow Jesus. Some people just don't even choose to acknowledge it at all. Sometimes it stirs up a really big controversy amongst, amongst the people what Jesus did. But even, so even in the resolution, there's always something different. And what I want us to do is to do something better. Just go a little bit deeper then. I, see, I read this miracle, I see this miracle, and I read, okay, Jesus is kind and Jesus is powerful. Both of those two things are absolutely true. And some of them are really going to emphasize the compassion of Jesus or the power of Jesus. But there's always another level. Because I think sometimes when we're kind of trying to process the miracles of Jesus, we can go into one of two very simplistic mindsets about the way that miracles work, both then and now. Sometimes there are some of us who think that because Jesus did all of these miracles, that any time I ask Jesus for anything, he will give me exactly what I want. Any need that I have, anything that I ask, he is obligated to do that. Which really just misses out on really a lot of the things that Jesus is wanting to do in, in for us etern- internally. To try to change us, to try to mold us. And, and, and we should never have an attitude that somehow we've got God on a string. But then that has led some people, and I think a lot of us probably fall into this category, well, because God doesn't do everything that I want all the time, God's probably not doing miracles at all. And we have these two extremes where somehow I can control God with my prayer life, or God isn't really interested in helping 
or is either is unable or unwilling to make a difference. And somewhere in here between is a really complex, deep view of who God is and who he is wanting to be in your life when you are the one that has the need. Because there are some of us here, we come here today, we come here with need. And what God is wanting to do, he's wanting to, he's, he's wanting to have an encounter with you. And his encounter with you is going to bring a measure, some sort of resolution. Right? So I picked here today, it's kind of a fairly simple one. A very simple kind of healing miracle of Jesus interacting with a blind man in Mark chapter, six, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46. So we'll try to notice kind of some things that maybe stand out about this, right? Mark 10, verse 46. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. There's a few things that I think that really kind of stand out in this one that kind of make it different. And you're thinking, bro, how can it be different? This is the first one we're looking at. And I get it. I'm telling you in advance, hey, there's some things about this one that are different, right? Okay. And we'll, and we'll see that because a lot of this, you'll notice seven verses, five of them are all pre him meeting Jesus. It seems to be a lot here about this person, Bartimaeus, which also that's something different. We get his name. Often it's like it was a woman who had been afflicted with this injury for 12 years or there 10 lepers came to Jesus. There was a man who was demon possessed. We know his name. We'll talk about it a little bit later why that, why that matters. We also get this picture of him shouting. There's just a lot of shouting, a lot of desperation. We also get a picture of a crowd who's like, bro, shut up. It's Jesus. Shh. And, and he, is, he is unmoved by that. He continues to shout all the more. Just there, there, there is a very vivid picture here of, that is being painted of Bartimaeus. And, and what I see is, is, is I see him just kind of flailing with desperation. Please, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Notice me, see me, please. I'm, I'm begging you. This was not a gentle request. This was someone in absolute desperation, flailing around, begging for Jesus. And the reality of it is, and I think that as we're, as we're trying to take these stories and really trying to insert them into our lives, I think we need to be honest with ourselves and recognize, hey, you know what? Sometimes we are the ones that's flailing. Sometimes, I'm, sometimes it's me. I'm flailing. I'm the one that is desperate. And if we look around here in the room, you got a lot of different people, a lot of different things going on. And I say that some of you are flailing. And some of you, like in your heart, like, yes, I am. And some of you don't want to ask the question enough to, to drill down to what's going on in your heart to connect with that reality. No, I, actually, I am. Now, you don't have to be. I'm not trying to talk everybody in here into being in a desperate situation. Some of you currently are and know it. Some of you currently are and don't know it. But a lot of us aren't, but have been or most certainly will be. And so sometimes it's us. And I think what I admire so much about Bartimaeus' response here is that he was absolutely aware of it and and, and, and shouting it, son of David, please have mercy on me. Now, I was going back and forth all week. I had a couple of stories. When I, like, I, as I was, even as I wrote that word, I was sending it into the people who make the slides flailing. There were just two stories 
that came, that came to me. Like, was like at times when I was like, man, this is me. This is when I was flailing. And I went back and forth all week. And even all the way up until the very beginning this morning, I was like, I was going back and forth. And even the one that I shared in the previous service, I'm like, was that the right one? Should I go with the other one? It's a great thing about having a lot of weeks and we're going to see a lot of people flailing. I can tell you a lot of stories about desperate situations. But here's the one that I went with, right? I was 12 years old, and we were uh, at a church trip, and we were going to float the buffalo, which was kind of an annual deal. And we had b- taken a break for lunch, and so we're over here on this kind of, this, this little dune over here, this kind of little island here. We're kind of eating, and the, and the river where we'd stopped was, very, was a lot of rapids. And so what we would do is the kids would get in at this side, and the river would carry us really fast down. And there was a guy who was on the trip. He was about the size of a wall. He would just stand here and you just go, poop. And, he would, and then he would just throw you to the shore and you got to run and do it again. It was absolutely a lot of fun. And me being 12, a boy and an idiot, I decided I want to do it one more time after the wall had gone. And so I get in there. It's going really fast, really fun. Then suddenly, okay, now I've got to stop myself, which of course I can do. I can stop. And, and then when panic hit me, and I, I was not then and am still not an incredibly strong swimmer, but I was strong enough to keep myself from keep going that way, but then panic started to say, okay, I've got to get out of here. And so I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to go that way, and I did the one thing they're not supposed to do is I went this way. I'm trying to swim this way, and I'm not stronger than that river. And I'm getting tired and more tired and more exhausted. And it is, without a doubt, the closest to death that I feel like I've ever been, and I was keenly aware of it. And in my absolute desperation, in my heart, in my mind, I think I'm crying out for help. I am sure that it probably only came out like, help. I am, I am scared to death. And to the degree that a 12-year-old has faith, I'm crying out to God. Help me. We'll pause it here a little bit, right? We're just going to unfold it as it goes on. But that's me. That's me flailing. Flailing about and, 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 and in a moment, and like I'm, I'm, I'm screaming and, and I'm, I'm begging for God. And that's my great encouragement to you. If you find yourself in that sort of situation, don't deny it. Don't hold it in. Allow yourself to be honest and honest with God because that clearly is what Jesus wants. Right? So they come to they say, hey man, cheer up, which is, I just love this interaction. The people who've just been telling him to be quiet. Hey, cheer up. Get on your feet, man. Jesus got you. So he, he pops up, says he pops up and goes to Jesus. And then Jesus says this, which to me is the most startling part of this entire story. What do you want me to do for you? He said to him. Now what a, like, are you playing? Like, like, like are you serious? Like, are you, is he being serious? Like, what, what? What I mean, a blind, like you're Jesus, right? I mean, like, first of all, he is Jesus, so he already knows, right? And, and he's blind, right? I mean, it's, it's clearly obvious. I mean, a little bit, it feels like maybe he's just kind of being obtuse, right? He's just kind of being kind of, well, oh, oh, blind dude, what do you want? I mean, like, it's obvious, blind dude, like, whoosh, like open his eyes, that's what he wants. But it's really interesting And I think that weird parts of stories are meant to slow us down. The weird parts are there for a reason. Man, like you think about it, and Jesus asked him this question. Because here's this dude flailing. And Jesus didn't assume. He didn't use the knowledge that he already had. He asked him. Because I think this is something that Jesus wants from us. When we're in these kinds of situations. To communicate our heart to him. So sometimes we're failing and you need to communicate your heart to Jesus. What do you want from me? Even though there was a clear and obvious reason, who knows what this guy was going to say? Because there are a number of things that he could have asked. He could have then said that would have been very small, that Jesus would have been perfectly capable of doing. I'm hungry. I would like something to eat. I don't have much money. Do you have any money to give me? There are any number of things that he could have asked for that, could have, that would have been small. My guess, oh, sure. Here, man, here's some, here's some bread. And I think it's also important for us to imagine that there are some answers that this, this guy could have given um, that Jesus would have turned down. What do you want me to do for you? Those people that told me to shut up, I want you to... I want you to smite them. 
want you to get them. I want you to vanquish my enemies. I want to be a king. I want to be rich. I want to be powerful. He could have said any number of those things. And Jesus would have been like, oh, that's, that's, not, that's, not what we're, that's not what we're doing. But we did in his moment of complete desperation when Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? I, I want to see. I want to see. He didn't, he didn't over-spiritualize it. He didn't under-communicate. He just, in a moment of real honesty, communicated very clearly his need to Jesus. Again, I'm 12 years old. I'm screaming, God, help me. And finally, somebody heard me. And I hear someone yell, swim to the side, which in hindsight, right, 40 years later is like, right. But in that moment, I was like, it was just, it was, it was life to me. And here's how exhausted and, I, and just not thinking well I was. Again, everybody over here, kind of on this rock, we're having a picnic, and over here is just trees and rocks. There's even no place really to stand. And I'm right here, I swim this way, right? I'm swimming this way, and I finally get to the shore, and I'm like, and I do. I turn and I look to see who it was that had called out to me. And there is literally no one on that side of the shore that is noticing me at all still. If someone had seen a child drowning, you would have not just yelled, you would be making sure that they made it completely. No one noticed. No one had told my parents. No one had any idea what had happened to me. The first time anybody noticed where I was, I heard somebody go, Hey! There's snakes over there. I'm like, thanks, bro. It's the least of my concerns right now. I was almost dead 30 seconds ago, but thanks for the snake warning. It is one of my two very clear, very obvious, audible voice of God stories. In a moment where I was as close to death as I have ever been, I cry out with my heart to God. And he spoke to me. And he saved me. And what we have here with Bartimaeus flailing around, son of David, have mercy on me. Please have mercy on me. Please. What do you want me to do? I want to see. Verse 52, go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, immediately he received his sight. And follow Jesus along the road. And sometimes we're just flailing. And we need to communicate our heart to Jesus. And we need to understand this. That Jesus responds to faith. And the really cool part of the story. We kind of noticed it a little bit at the beginning. It says a blind man, Bartimaeus. They knew who this guy was. So what I imagine is, you know, as they're getting ready to write these gospels, as his disciples are reflecting on who Jesus is and what he did and what they want to put down as they're collecting these stories and trying to paint this picture of who Jesus is, there was, you know, like, hey, do you remember that one time, that one guy? Hey, you remember that one time we were with those few people and this thing happened? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? And it's like, you remember Bartimaeus? I mean, like, he's, like this is a guy they knew and it says as much. It says that right after this, when Jesus healed him, your faith has healed you. He says he got up in the line with the disciples and started following. And it's a beautiful picture there of someone expressing this faith towards Jesus. That Jesus responds to him and then he responds back with following. This was a guy that the disciples knew. This, this guy was part of the team. It was a beautiful story because very often again in these stories we have... Well, they're unknown people. We don't know what happens to them. Or they're not, comp they're not thankful at all. They just kind of walk away. But here's a guy who, was, who became a part of them. And it began with an act of faith on the part of Bartimaeus. Now, I ask you that. I, I, we, I you say that. And I think it is of absolute critical importance to Ask and answer the question that I would imagine a few of you are thinking. What does that mean? It is really easy 
it is really easy to be a, a preacher, to be up here and go, you know what? God wants faith from you and he will respond to you when you come to him in faith. Let's pray. I don't know. What is that? What, what does that mean though? No, have faith. You just need to have faith. Okay. I, was, I grew up in Sunday school. I've been around a long time. I'm supposed to have faith. But what is it? Oh, it sounds like you don't have faith. Bro, I'm going to punch you. In the... What is it? Because I think we can be a little too, and you hear me talk about this already today. I talk about this all the time. We can be incredibly simplistic about this idea. Is faith simply the belief that I know that God is capable of doing the thing? So Bartim, was Bartimaeus' faith, I know that Jesus is capable of healing me, so I'm going to ask. I don't think so. That is a theological concept. I, I, I believe that. I think we all, if we took a theology class together right now and there was a quiz, is God all-powerful? Yes. Does that mean he can do anything? Yes. Is he capable of doing anything that you ask? Yes. Okay, it's not that. It's not, it's not simply a, a, a knowledge, a knowledge of, of who he is. Is it the absolute belief that God will do it? If I ask him, I know with zero doubt he will do it. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky because there are a significant number of people out there and some incredible Christian groups that really will teach along these lines that somehow that if I have the, 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 this certain amount of confidence an unwavering confidence when I ask God to do something that he will then be obligated to say yes. Now I phrase it that way because I think it is important for us to understand kind of the, the theological dangers of believing that. God is not obligated to do something for you simply because you are confident in it. Because really where does confidence come from? I can confidently ask God to do something and believe that he will do it if it is consistent with his character. If I know that he's wanting to do it in my life, if, if, if I have this fuller, deeper understanding, which very often when I'm flailing around in my life and, and I'm verbalizing to God what I want, very often I don't know what's best. Just because it's what I'm asking doesn't mean that it's what's best. There are plenty of times in my life where there is something that I have desperately wanted and I've begged God for it and I have not received it but received something different and better. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to tell the story real quick without crying. I talk about it all the time, right? We've got, we've got three daughters and they, they're 14, 25, 22, and 11. And when the, the middle one was born, we never went back on birth control. We believed that God was, wanted us to have a third kid. And we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and angry and flailed and flailed and screamed. And at just the right time, through foster care and adoption, the most amazing little girl enters our home. Eleven years of flailing and telling God very specifically what we wanted and not getting it. And he gave us something very different way later than what we, want, when, when we wanted it. Faith is not just simply a knowledge that God is capable of something. And it's certainly not believing that somehow that by my, by, the, by an act of my own confidence and will that I can bend God to do what I want to do. It is a confident trust in the relationship and in the character of God. That I trust when I speak to him, I know that he hears and I trust in the response. I trust that when I say this is what I want, that I trust relationally in Him in the response. It is about a deep level connection and commitment and love relationship with Him. And it's, it's real easy to say when you're not flailing. But faith isn't found and an irrational confidence or a theological understanding. 
but in a moment by moment, day to day belief and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And so over the next few weeks, we're gonna put a lot of more meat on the bones. We're gonna get a lot of more pieces to the puzzle as we're hoping to kind of create this fuller picture of what Jesus Christ wants to do in your life when we are the one with the need. But let's just start here and reflect on this. That when we are, when we are the one in need, let's be honest about it. Let's be honest about it with ourselves. Let's be honest about it with Jesus. And, and then when we come to him, speak the need to him. There's so many of us pretending to be spiritual, saying we're fine to ourselves and to others and to God when really we're this close to drowning. And then I'll say, this is what I need. And by faith, I trust not in a specific response, but in the specific person that is responding. And I trust in him. And I know that he will respond to my faith and my trust in him. And he will bring healing. He will bring hope. He will bring life. And the fuller and deeper I understand him, the more I understand what those things are gonna mean. So as we have some moment to respond, I just encourage you. We have this place in the back where you can take communion and you can connect with God in that way. There's a cross where you can pray. There's prayer candles where you can pray. There's people that love to pray with you or for you. But if you're the one that's flailing, let's have a moment. And let's have a moment where we're just asking God to deepen our faith and our trust in him. Believing that he wants to respond back to you. Let me pray. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover in our sermon podcast or just in other issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast. It's on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.